Okay, in this video, we are gonna go over a couple of things uh, that my students are still getting wrong, despite the fact that the AP exam is on Monday. And I should clarify, there's like a million things they're getting right. These are just the little things that are still kind of nagging at us. So uh, let's take a look. First up, derivative of inverse at a point. So if g of x equals f inverse of x, I kind of have this summary for you. You could screenshot this or pause it or whatever. I'm just gonna like dive in. Basically, it's g prime of b is equal to one over f prime of a. They will give you B. You often have to solve for A. Sometimes they give you A on the more modern versions of the exam. They're actually just like giving you a table of values and you seek out B in the Y value column and see what A value is associated with it and then find the derivative. Let's do some problems. All right, we got uh, F and G are functions that are differentiable everywhere. If G is the inverse of F, G of negative two is five. F prime of five is negative one half. G, then G prime of negative two. So what I like to do on these problems because I like to really organize it, is I just kind of like write down like a, b is on f of x, b, a is on g of x, and then g prime of b is one over f prime of a. I literally write that when I'm doing the problem, and then I need to find what a is equal to, right? Because they've given me b, b is negative two. So for g of x, I know that uh, negative two, five is a point on g of x, that's given, which means that f of x has the point five, negative two, and g prime of negative two is one over f prime of five, they tell us f prime of five is negative one half. Um, I don't remember the source of this problem actually, um, but the answer is one over uh, negative one half, so negative two. Let's take a look at another one, basically the same thing. Uh, this is from 2003. These are, these are all super old problems, but they're all relevant to the exam still. So uh, f, is, f of x is x cubed plus x, g of x is f inverse, g of two is one, what is the value of g prime of two? So it feels really similar because it is really similar. So we go through the same process, right? Like what point is on g of x? So g of x has the point two, one. What point is on f of x? Um, the point would be one, two. And so if we wanna find g prime of two, it's one over f prime of one. This problem's a little different because we have to find f prime. So f prime is three x squared plus one. So then we plug in one, which gives us three plus one, so four, and then our answer will be one fourth. Look at the answer choices, that would be B. Let's take a look at another one like this, and then we'll move on to a different topic. This is from 2008. Um, same setup, F of three is 15, F of six is three, F prime of three is negative eight, F prime of six is negative two. In my experience on the modern exam, they give you this information in a table of values, um, but whatever, it's still the same problem. Uh, what is G prime of three? I'm gonna do the exact same thing, except here it's like a little less obvious, right? So uh, we know we're looking for g prime of three. So the x value for g is three. So we have like three comma what? We don't really know what. So now we look at all the given information and we figure out um, there's gonna be an f point that is something comma three. So the given information, either f of three is 15 or f of six is three. So three is the y value. We look at this, right? So we can fill that in. So six and six go there. Now it's g prime of three is one over f prime of six. You look at the givens again, f prime of six is negative two. So our answer is negative one half. No reason to get this wrong. Uh, this is often like the last multiple choice question on the non-calculator section. It is also often in the free response questions uh, with like a table of values type of problem. So that's our answer. The next topic that my students are still kind of messing up. This one I think is fair. Uh, right ream on sums. So not like doing it from a table of values. Nobody's messing that up. Good job, everybody. Um, but when it's multiple choice, so the base is delta x, b minus a over n. Evaluation points, x sub k or x sub star or x star sometimes. Um, it's a plus k times delta x. The height of the rectangle is going to be f of x sub k. So you plug in the evaluation point. So to approximate the integral, it's gonna be approximately delta x and then the quantity f of x1, f of x2, blah, 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 to f of xn. To find the actual value of the definite integral, it's gonna be the limit as n approaches infinity of the sum from one to n of f of x sub k delta x. And sometimes they write it out as a summation. Sometimes they actually give you like the summation thing and just say like, which of these is equal to this. Let's look at the problems. So 1988, uh, this says bc, but it could totally be on ab as well. Uh, the expression one over 50 and then all these square roots is a Riemann sum. In my experience on the actual AP exam, always a right Riemann sum. On review books, things like that, sometimes it'll be a left Riemann sum. 
Uh, the process is basically the same. Honestly, if you just tell yourself like, this is a weird right ream on sum, you'll probably get it right anyway. Um, so what I like to do is I like to identify delta x, x1, x2, x3, all the way to x50. So we're using just 50 rectangles to approximate this. What are we plugging into? I would say that we are plugging into the square root of x. Um, we identified delta x was one over 50. And then x sub k would be zero where we're kind of starting because remember you've already plugged in one so this is zero plus the one over 50 that you're seeing in that first radical is zero plus one delta x and then it's zero plus two delta x is zero plus three delta x is and finally zero plus 50 delta x is so our x sub k is zero plus k delta x if you find x zero and x 50 i mean they basically give it to you in this case but um x zero is just zero and then x50 is definitely 1. So this will be the integral from 0 to 1 of the square root of x dx. So that's going to be option B. Let's look at another one. So it's the limit um, as n approaches infinity of 1 over n, the square root of 1 over n plus root 2 over n plus dot 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 plus root n over n. This is from 1997. This is literally the same problem. So I'm just going to circle the answer. It's not literally the same answer. In the previous one, they used n equals 50. They just like went up to 50 rectangles. Here, they're going to infinity. But the first one was approximating. This is finding the exact value. Either way, it's like the same problem. Let's look at another one. There's no reason to really be afraid of these. It's kind of like what I'm getting at here. There's a lot of things you shouldn't be afraid of on the exam that do feel kind of challenging, um, but they're not that bad. So uh, 1997 again, but this is the BC exam. Uh, but this is, I think, fair game for the AB exam as well. Closed interval AB is partitioned into n equal sub intervals, each of with delta x. So that's just like delta x is b minus a over n. Um, by the numbers blah 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 blah. What is the limit as n approaches infinity? Uh, i goes from one to n square root of x sub i delta x. Maybe this explains why i use i as my um, index and the modern exam uses k. Like I literally took this exam in 1997. Maybe back then they were just using i as an index all the time. I don't know. Um, so again, what function are you plugging your evaluation points into? Clearly it is the square root of x. And then we have to say to ourselves, like, where are we starting and where are we stopping? This one's given to you kind of weirdly because they just tell you you're starting at a and ending at b. So this would be, this limit is our definite integral, right? So we're doing the definite integral from a to b of the square root of x dx. Think of it as x to the one half plus one times the reciprocal, takes us two thirds, x to the three halves. We're gonna pull two thirds out and then quantity b to the three halves minus a to the three halves looks like um, option a to me. And that's pretty good. Let's take a look at another thing that they're still getting wrong. I don't think it's a disaster. I think if they study a little bit, everybody's gonna be fine on this. Volumes with cross sections. So there's volumes of revolution, that's just pi, the integral of big R squared minus little r squared, right? So square subtract square. Um, this is volume with cross sections. So if you have square cross sections, it's just the integral of s squared. If you have rectangular cross sections, it's k times s squared, where like the base is s and then the height is k times s. So like the base is uh, in the xy plane perpendicular to the x-axis, and then the height is five times the base. So you would get five times S times S, five S squared. Um, equilateral triangles are always root three over four, the integral of S squared. Semicircles, which is the one that you definitely want to, like these two, equilateral triangle and semicircle, but in particular semicircle, because they seem to ask about that all the time. And equilateral triangle, almost never. But who knows, maybe I'm dooming all of us to that being on the exam this year. Semicircles, pi over eight, just memorize it. Um, and then integral of s squared. But notice all of them are the integral of s squared. There's one other option, um, and that could be they just tell you the area of a cross section. They'll just be like, the area of a cross section is uh, 15 sine of 2x plus 35. And you're like, what would that look like? It doesn't matter. If you know the area of a cross section, you just integrate the area of a cross section from a to b. So in all of these that refer to s, s, because I'm doing everything dx, is going to be top takeaway bottom. If you're doing it dy, which is less common, but of course could be on the exam, you're going to do right takeaway left. So um, same idea though, but just the right curve take away the left curve. Everything would be in terms of y, and the lower bound would be a y value, the upper bound would be a y value. Let's take a look at some problems. These, in my experience, mostly calculator problems, so I'm going to kind of like gloss over that. This one's from 2012. 
um, below by y equals x squared, above by y equals uh, radical x. The cross sections perpendicular to the x-axis are squares. What is the volume of the solid? So first thing you might do is like graph it, find some intersection points. I like to draw S when I'm doing this. So here's S. S is going to be top takeaway bottom. So that's root X minus X squared. We're going to integrate from zero to one S squared. So I like to write it out, not like in terms of S. I like to actually plug in, but this is our integral. It's a calculator problem. Plugged it in. I didn't even look at what the error is. I have no idea. It's probably something about approximate arithmetic would be my guess, but I'm going to circle that. So that was in 2012. Uh, but this, it's like a recurring type of problem. So here's a problem from 2003, which I know is forever ago. Base of a solid in the region uh, is the region of the first quadrant, bounded by the y-axis, the graph of arc 10, and the horizontal line y equals 3, the vertical line x equals 1. A lot of description there. So like you can graph it. The y-axis is involved. x equals 3 is involved. Um, sorry, x equals 1 is involved. y equals 3 is involved. Whatever. Uh, I'm going to draw what I think S is. Here it is. Top takeaway bottom. So that's going to be 3 minus arctan. And then our bounds are going to go from 0 to 1, those vertical lines that they described. So we'll set up our integral. Since it's squares, it's just S squared. If it was equilateral triangles, it'd be root 3 over 4 and then S squared. If it was semicircles, it'd be pi over 8, S squared. Same setup no matter what. It's just what's that coefficient going to be? And then this is calculator. So we can circle an answer. It looks like B. Uh, I got another one for you. Uh, this one is from 1998. So the base of a solid is the region shown. Uh, X-axis, Y-axis, the line X plus 2Y equals 8, as if that's going to throw us off. Uh, cross sections perpendicular to the X-axis are semicircles. So what is the volume of the solid? I would rather do a volume with cross sections than a volume of revolution almost any day of the week. It's a little bit easier to set. I mean, neither of them are like super challenging, but it's a little bit easier to set up. Um, so what I'm first going to do is just like solve this thing for y, right? So subtract x, divide by 2, you get 8 minus x all over 2. So we need to figure out s is, so top takeaway bottom. Uh, and that's just going to be f of x minus 0, or just f of x. Um, and then because it is semicircles, it's pi over 8 s squared. We're integrating along the x-axis, so from 0 to 8. This is our integral calculator problem. I got 16.755. I got... C. All right. Uh, one more. I just took this one from Khan Academy because I could not find one on like a publicly available exam where they were using equilateral triangles. Like they exist. It's in the curriculum. It like literally calls out equilateral triangles and semicircles, but like no examples. Make sure you know it's, it's going to be root three over four. Also Khan Academy making us do this by hand. So that's great. Um, y equals e to the negative x, x axis, y axis, x equals one. So Here's S. S is going to be uh, top takeaway bottom, so e to the negative x minus 0, or just e to the negative x. We set it up because equilateral triangles, it's root 3 over 4, and then S squared. Uh, then, you know, e to the negative x squared is e to the negative 2x. So we have this. Uh, so you have to do, like, I don't know, u substitution. Like, there should have been a negative 2, or the chain rule. There should have been a negative 2, so a negative 1 half. So our coefficient becomes root 3 over 4 times negative 1 half, or negative root 3 over 8 e to the negative 2x from 0 to 1, factor out the negative root 3 over 8, quantity e to the negative 2 minus 1. That's the exact value of the solid. I mean, I guess if this was multiple choice, you would pick it. I don't know what they would do with that, but uh, I wanted to do an example that looked of that form. Let's look at it. Uh, so this is actually going to be the last topic that I'm going to like highlight that is still a little bit shaky, and I like it because it's literally the first topic, basically, of calculus. The limit definition of the derivative shows up in multiple choice. And when it shows up, it's like a gift. You just have to work out what's going on. So the derivative as a function would be f prime of x is limit as h approaches 0, f of x plus h minus f of x over h. The derivative at x equals a, so a value f prime of a, limit as h approaches 0, f of a plus h minus f of a over h. You're literally just replacing all the x's with a's, but I wanted to highlight the difference there. It is also possible that you'll get the other version of the derivative. Limit is x approaches a, f of x minus f of a over x minus a. If you get that though, there's a really good chance you won't even notice it's the derivative. You'll just use L'Hopital's rule on it and move on. So I'm not super concerned about that type. Um, this one on the other hand shows up kind of frequently. Uh, so let's take a look at it. So we got the limit is h approaches 0, 
natural log of 4 plus h minus natural log of 4 over h, it looks like a scary limit. Like, if you see the limit as h approaches 0, immediately think this is probably the definition of the derivative. Like, don't even mess around. It, you got to start thinking that. So if it is the definition of the derivative, it'll look like this. We need to figure out f of x. I mean, you're pretty clearly plugging into natural log of x. So f of x is natural log of x. f prime, because this is the definition of the derivative, f prime is 1 over x. And then what are you plugging in? You're plugging in 4. So f prime of 4 is 1 fourth b. Let's look at another one. So here we have the limit as h approaches 0, which is, again, the trigger for thinking this is the definition of the derivative. We have e to the 2 plus h minus e squared over h. So we got to decide what is our function. I think our function is pretty clearly e to the x. And what are we, uh, so our derivative is also e to the x. So, you know, um, what are we plugging in? We're plugging in 2. So f prime of 2, e squared. We are getting d. Uh, let's look at, I got two more. So here, this one goes way back. This is from 1969. Um, the, it turns out this was on a lot. This was on the old exam a lot. I like searched a PDF for just limb and it came up with like tons of them. Uh, I didn't pull all of them because I don't think we need all of them. Uh, this is limit as h approaches zero, eight quantity. Uh, so the h approaches zero immediately, definition of derivative. Eight quantity, one half plus h to the eighth minus eight quantity, one half to the eighth all over h. Um, so we got to identify the function. What are you plugging into? So it's remember, it's f of a plus h minus f of a. We're plugging one half plus h in, and then we're plugging one half in. What are we plugging into? 8x to the eighth. And then we're finding the derivative, right? So the derivative of that is 64x to the seventh. Um, and then we're going to plug in one half. And then, I don't know, maybe they think, like, were people better at, at math uh, in their heads, like arithmetic stuff? Like, probably? I don't know. Um, on the modern exam, do I think they would do this to you? I'm not really sure. I don't, I don't necessarily think they would, but, uh, 64 is eight, uh, squared and eight is two cubed. So it's two cubed squared. That's two to the sixth over two to the seventh, which is one half. So I would circle one half. Um, there you go. Interestingly on this one, because I had five options, they put can't be determined from the given information. And then also limit does not exist. Uh, but we know that it's the definition of the derivative. And I got one more for you, and then I'm going to wish you uh, the best of luck on this exam. So let's see. The limit as h approaches 0, tangent of 3 quantity x plus h minus tangent of 3x all over h. So this looks to me like f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. So f of x, I think, is tangent of 3x. The derivative of tangent is secant squared. We need the chain rule. So this will be 3 secant squared of 3x. So we are getting... Uh, option B. And uh, that's it. These are the things that uh, I think at the last second, my students are still struggling with a little bit. So I thought maybe some of you would be as well. Uh, I hope this was helpful and uh, really good luck on the exam. I hope you get exactly what you were looking for.